Hopefully you guys are all seeing this. Um, our webinar today is going to be how to apply for an IEM scholarship. Um, and you're going to receive some tips from commissioners and our previous awardees. As I mentioned, um, I am the chair of the scholarship commission. I've been on the commission now for going on, I think six years. Um, and joining us today um, are two of our previous scholarship winners, uh, Nora Yatsov, uh, who is a, uh, a uh, current scholarship commission member and a past scholarship recipient, and Terry Martin, also um, serving as a student member representative on the commission, also a past scholarship uh, recipient. And so really the purpose and importance um, of the scholarship program really is we wanted as part of IAM uh, was to find a way to promote and develop disaster preparedness resilience by helping students with the educational process. Um, all of us, as, as you know, um, through the first slide, um, possess um, degrees or advanced degrees um, within the fields of emergency management. And um, hopefully the reason you all are in school is to help further the knowledge base and, and careers in the profession. Uh, and with that comes a price tag, right? And so you guys are all out there seeking some, some assistance in the pursuit of that degree. And so we developed the scholarship program to help students uh, with that process because we know tuition, it's not cheap, books are not cheap. And by providing a scholarship um, through our role as the scholarship commission helps provide scholarships in the categories of undergraduate, graduate and part-time graduate students. So we've been around um, actually for a pretty long time. Uh, we're going on our 23rd year. The first year we awarded a scholarship was back in 2001. It took us almost two years to kind of get the program in place, start raising money. We got that first scholarship off the ground in 2001 and it was actually pretty limited. Um, in 2017, uh, we also added awards for part-time graduate students. That was the first time. And to date, we have given out almost $179,000 in awards, um, which, which is quite a bit of money uh, in terms of, uh, you know, really the size of, of the program we are. Thank you, uh, Dr. Barbaruso. I uh, would like to introduce myself, Nori Altsev. I'm a past scholarship recipient and I'll cover the next portion of the presentation before we, uh, we move on to the demonstration. Um, so you're here and you're wondering, you know, can I apply, do I qualify to apply for the scholarship? And I'm gonna cover in the next few slides areas, uh, maybe some significant questions that you may have just to see if you, really can um, apply for, for this process. But um, obviously anybody that's earning a degree in emergency management or related fields, so this could be homeland security, community preparedness, um, closely related to emergency management in, in the field that you're studying in, those students are uh, qualified and are encouraged to apply for these scholarships. Um, additionally, we have uh, two caveats to this. Um, undergraduate students, those earning their undergraduate degree, need to be full-time in order to apply for the program. Uh, but for graduate students, we have added uh, two different levels of applications. Graduate students may be full-time or maybe part-time students. Uh, we understand that typically, you know, if you're going into graduate um, school, you may be working. So having you know, requiring a full-time graduate program may not be feasible for a lot of people in the industry or working uh, full-time to get into the industry. So we've added the part-time um, option for graduate students. Uh, additionally, for those that are working part-time though, there is a requirement to be involved in the industry. So, you know, for many people that are looking to get into emergency management and advance their chances of getting into the industry, um, it's, it's often challenging and pursuing an actual degree is a great way to get into the field uh, rather than just trying to get in through experience alone. So understanding that uh, for those part-time students, it's important to have a, a connection through the emergency management industry. Uh, but don't despair. Uh, it's, uh, it's not required that you're working already in the industry because I understand that uh, you're trying to get into the field. So some of the activities that would qualify is if you volunteer through an organization. There's a lot of 
Um, whether it's sponsored through a fire department, there's citizen corps programs or neighborhood emergency team programs um, that are possible to um, volunteer in those activities. There are um, community organizations active in disaster. There's a lot of ways to volunteer there. Uh, there, where I'm based at in Portland, Oregon, Multnomah County is our county. Um, the emergency management uh, department in Multnomah County has uh, various internships that are available through um, logistics uh, support or through sheltering support. And there's a lot of different ways to, to really volunteer in the emergency management industry to get your foot into the door um, and get some experience in that. So don't despair if you are uh, looking to still get into the field, but you don't have a, a job or a position yet into the field. Um, you can still qualify by um, starting to participate in voluntary activities. Um, so I just want to clarify that, make sure um, nobody's discouraged that's listening to this. And uh, the other question that may often come up is you're looking to register into a program. You have signed up, but you haven't officially started your courses yet. So um, that's also possible. Um, if you have been accepted into a program, you can apply. There's a couple of requirements in order to meet the application um, requirements. So uh, your undergraduate transcripts, of course, um, noting that you have graduated um, with an undergraduate degree and a letter of acceptance. Now timing, timing wise, this may be challenging for some of those. So while we do require an, a letter of acceptance or enrollment, um, this can come in a variety of forms. This can come from the registrar, this can come from um, a professor, this can come from um, uh, sources that uh, may or may not be, uh, you know, available at the time, depending on the program you're getting into. So if there are any questions or you have challenges with that, um, we can, um, I do encourage you to contact um, the administrator, Dawn. Her email is um, spread throughout the page and um, she can assist you with uh, at attempting to obtain this proof, uh, but just understanding that um, there does need to be a proof of acceptance and understanding what the timeline of this application period, that may be a challenge for some, but don't be discouraged. It is possible to uh, work and, and try to make sure that um, that um, information is captured in the application. So another big question that often comes up is how much um, are the awards and how many awards will there be in 2024? Um, those are determined uh, based on uh, what, what we earn through a variety of um, different fundraising opportunities. As you may uh, be aware that there's an auction, an online auction going on right now. Um, it's the spring auction, auction. We also have a live and an online auction during the fall conference as well. So that helps earn um, funding for the awards. And additionally, um, depending on the pool of candidates. So if we have a high number of volume of candidates, um, awards may be split out to more than one candidate um, in category. So um, there is at least one candidate per category, the undergraduate, the graduate. And in recent years, the awards have ranged. Um, Full-time students have received up to 4,000 or more and part-time students of 2,000 or more. So it's quite a valuable process and application to go through uh, because the um, awards are, are significant to contribute quite a bit to your cause. And then of course, there's other benefits. It's not just the money or the funding. Um, some of the other uh, real tangible benefits are the registration to the upcoming conference. Um, this is the registration fee that does not cover the housing, transportation, or the other expenses, but it will cover the registration fee, which is a significant um, cost, cost to bear, especially for students and just understanding that, um, you know, while you're spending money on college and trying to work as best as you can. This is a great benefit to add to that additional award. Um, also, uh, recipients are recognized during the annual conference and it's great to have, you know, 2000 people um, there to see the, the accomplishment that those recipients have made and, and being recognized and awarded those scholarships. Um, additionally, they'll be um, noted on the website and the bulletin and uh, each recipient can be published by the IAM Bulletin, which is great because um, 
that is a publication that works towards um, a lot of your um, certification, your CEM requirements. So you can actually, um, it goes a long way and it has um, bonus that is gained, um, you know, through these various recognitions. Um, also, uh, and I have personally used this, I was a 2015-16 scholarship recipient in the graduate category. Um, when I had gone back to school after 20 years to get my graduate degree, uh, my career had stalled and I was looking for something to bump it up uh, quite a bit more. And so I um, started graduate school in emergency management, applied for the scholarship, received the scholarship. I leveraged it. I used it on my resume and, uh, you know, I ended up um, making being able as a result of graduate school and with the assistance of the program being able to excel in my career and um, realized um, several promotions since then. So I can attest to the value and the time um, that's spent um, in the application process and, and how important it is to, to um, you know, the value that it provides, the added bonus. And then finally, um, here's a couple of quick tips before we go into the demonstration. Um, so. On the IEM website, there's a scholarship um, tab section, and the first um, the first sub tab under that is the 2024 scholarship application. Make sure you download and read the instructions. There are in a hyperlink in that uh, website. Uh, read them; they provide you with everything that you need to know about the application process. There is also a checklist for each of the three categories. So, depending on if you're full time undergraduate full-time graduate or part-time graduate, there's a different application um, and a different checklist for each of those applications. So before you start your process, get familiar, um, read those and, and become uh, familiar with the requirements. There are essay questions and you will see what those essay questions are on each of the application checklists because they do vary based on the undergraduate, full-time graduate um, applications. So get familiar with those. The application instructions will have the parameters for those essay questions. So if you have questions on how to structure your essays, how many words, the font, the, the typeface, those parameters are included in the application instructions for you. Um, another, another great tip is only include the documents that are required for your application type. And, um, you know, it really just helps streamline the process. It really just helps make sure that um, the commissioners, when they review the applications, they have exactly what they're looking for and they can compare um, the applicants uh, based on similar types of criteria. Um, so uh, the resumes are for the part-time graduate students. Um, that is a requirement for, for those. And um, and we're not they're not required to be removed um, prior to review. So um, for any, any questions on that, um, I just recommend you get very familiar with the instructions and the process. And with that, um, the, the last other tip that I failed to mention is make sure that you uh, document uh, your upload them as PDFs, not Word documents, not um, JPEGs, not any type of um, PowerPoint or Excel documents. PDFs work best. And with that, I will hand it over to Terry to run and run through the application process itself. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. So these are the things I'm going to cover. Um, Terry Martin, I am a current student, uh, the student member on the uh, scholarship committee and also a previous uh, recipient. So I'm going to go through the application process with you and talk about some of the things that helped me as I was going through the submission, it's a, it's a very simple submission process. Um, as long as you have all the things you need with you. Um, and so I'm gonna help you make sure you cross all your T's and dot all your I's. So the first thing you'll do is you'll go to the IEM website um, and I'll show you how to navigate to the scholarship application from the main page if you don't have the full link as shown here. Um, as Nora mentioned, you'll figure out which application type you need to do first. Um, so once you have that, you'll have the instructions and then the application checklist associated with the, um, the one that you are trying to get. Um, then you'll complete the online application and I'm gonna walk you through that, um, including uh, making sure you have a login. If you've ever done anything through IAM, you may already have a login. 
Uh, you can always try the process to reset your password. And if something shows up in your email, then you do have a login. If not, you just register and you don't have to be an IAM member to get an, um, an award. So um, I'll walk through that. And then I'll also walk through the required documents that you need. Um, and then let just to kind of reiterate, um, the process uh, you can be done over a period of days, just as long as you're done by the, the deadline. Um, you can start the process and upload documents as you have them and then come back in and keep working on it as you have time. So don't feel pressure to do it all at once. Um, so with that, I can go to the uh, live demonstration. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna go to and share. Okay, so as I mentioned, you can get to uh, the scholarship application page straight from the main IEM website. Um, if you're patient, it's on the banner too, so it might just show up here. Um, if not, you can always find it under resources, scholarships, and it's the first one, 2024 IAM scholarship. So this is where all of the documents that we've talked about are that which are critical to making sure you do this correctly. So as you scroll down, you'll want to make sure you determine which is the um, application that you qualify for, whether it's full-time undergrad, full-time graduate, part-time graduate, because there are some nuances. So you want to make sure you get the right one. So you'll, you'll have the, um, the application along with instructions and a checklist. So I'm gonna walk you through going through um, the part-time graduate application checklist because that is the one that requires a resume. The other ones do not. So as Nora mentioned, make sure you're going through the checklist and you're only including the things that are required for your application. So when I click on begin the part-time graduate application, it's gonna prompt me to either log in or register. So I'm gonna log in. And this is a, a, a fake one that I created for the demonstration. And once you've logged in, the, um, once you create a, sorry, once you create an account, um, you'll have some basic information that will already preload in your application. So you can see I have some kind of dummy information here that was saved for when I created an account in the first place. So this is the application portion. So there's an application portion and then the portion where you upload your documents. So when you go through here, you'll scroll down. One thing I wanna mention is everything is pre-populated except for country. So you'll wanna make sure you choose your country. If you don't, you'll get prompt, prompted that something is missing, so it's just fine. So you'll fill in some basic information here. Not all schools are the same anymore, so put in if it's semesters or quarters or something else. What degree you're pursuing, your major, when do you plan to graduate, program of study, um, a link to the um, program itself. What is your job um, position? So put in your specific position related to emergency management. Um, how many hours you know you potentially do this position? And then you'll scroll down and you'll hit I affirm that I am applying to IEM scholarship and everything's in original work, truthful, complete, and accurate. And then you'll hit complete application. Once you've done that, it will save your information within the website. So you can come back anytime. So what you'll do is you'll find this in your dashboard. So you're logged in, you go to your dashboard. Oh, I knew I was gonna do that. It really wants me to update my information because this is uh, a new account. So I'm gonna go back and to my dashboard and do, so you may get that prompt also. <laughs> Hopefully, okay. Okay, here we go. So I can bypass that um, question that's asking me to update my communication preferences. 
So here is the application process that I started. So I can come back in here anytime and start working on it. So this is where you can add documents. Now, when I did this, um, I had gone through, and I'll pull it up. My, I have to go down like this because uh, that toolbar always gets in my way. So when we had the, the application um, checklist, I made sure I had each one of these things saved in a folder. Now, once I knew all the things I had to have saved, I went through the instructions and I'm, um, I guess it's still the same size for you guys. You can't see me expanding. Okay, good. Um, the instructions have a uh, very specific naming specifications. So you want to make sure you're going back and forth. You have the checklist item that you know you need to complete. And then you come over here, just like, you know, a rubric for a, an assignment that you're working on. You want to go through and make sure you're doing each of these things. So for example, awards, last name, underscore award list, and then a number with that list. So say you have three awards you want to include let you have them bolded in your list and then you name each file award one that sort of thing so each so what i did was um if i pull up my folder are you able to see a folder on my screen or no okay so i'm gonna stop sharing and then share one more time just so you can see what i found to be helpful So I had a folder where I started storing each of the things that I was requesting from my professors. When I would find an award and I would scan it and I would put it all in here. So I had everything in one place and following all the naming standards that were requested. Okay. Um, do we have any questions? Am I good to keep going? All right. Now, if I minimize, are you able to see the application? I don't see any head nodding. How about that? All right, thank you. Okay, so um, this is the point where you go through and you add each document. Um, they're all, all the different ones you need are available here. Um, so I would, I went through each of my folders, sorry, um, each of my files in that folder and, um, did one at a time. So for example, I would choose resume and make sure it was listed as resume. And then I would choose enrollment verification, choose file. And then I would find it in here. Everything is named so clearly, it's really easy to make sure that everything is exactly what it's supposed to be. So I don't have to go through all of these necessarily. So let's say these are the only things I have so far. Um, and I don't have time to work on it anymore. I'm getting more documents. I can hit submit. And now all of these things are saved. Um, but you know, don't have to fear. This doesn't mean it's going to the commission right now and you can't go back in. Uh, you have up until the deadline to go in here and to continue to add and edit and make updates. Um, so remember, you go in and it's in your dashboard saved once you hit uh, submit application on that first screen. Anything, do we have any questions? That's really the whole process. Like I said, it's really straightforward. As long as you have all your documents named correctly and in a folder that you can find easily, the whole process um, doesn't take long. Um, it's really acquiring all of the things that you need to do. You know, writing your essay, getting your uh, references. That was one of the first thing I did was I reached out to get references from each of the people I need to give them enough time to write it and get it back to me. Um, going through my university to make sure all those documents that are required um, are sent um, the way they're supposed to be, whether it's through email um, or certified uh, official route. Um, all those things that take a little while, did those first, and then I worked on my essay. 
and gathering all my uh, awards and scanning them in and saving them and that sort of thing. So that's the, it, the end of my demonstration. I can stop sharing my screen and hand it back over. Okay, at this time, um, we definitely like to open um, the floor to some questions. And oh, we got one in there. Um, I'm an international student studying in the US. So for the address, I will be using the US address, right? Correct. Barb, you have another one. Okay. One of, one of the essay questions says, please briefly describe your current comprehensive emergency management related activities. I just recently, two days ago, joined the CERT team. I struggle on figuring out how to answer the question with such limited time so far in the volunteer position. What advice can you offer? Um, I, I would definitely say, Chaz, to um, definitely do some research. Um, there's nothing to prohibit you from um, doing any research. Uh, we certainly hope that you do. I mean, you guys are in college. Um, you, you're around folks um, doing this job um, that you'll be able to, to go ahead and draw from their knowledge as well. Um, and, and, you know. Uh, build upon that base, um, you know, that'll, that'll get your, you know, that'll get your foot, you know, in the door and, and get your thoughts running um, as far as that goes. Um, none of the questions are designed, uh, you know, when we sit down as a commission and develop these questions, we're very conscious about um, the various levels and degrees of experience um, so that they're not slanted one way or another um, to keep the playing field level. So kind of keep that, keep that in mind, um, you know, that there, you know, we try to eliminate all bias, um, you know, as we, as we draft these questions and don't feel that um, you're on any short end of the stick, if you will, with regards to that question. Okay. Barb, I have do have several other questions that have okay. come in. Um, the next one takes us back to the citizenship question. You've answered that an outside citizen studying in the U.S. has to be has to use the U.S. address. I have another question about citizenship. Do you have to be a U.S. citizen or studying in the U.S. to receive a scholarship? You don't have to be a U.S. citizen. Um... But Don, were our did we require our universities to be U.S. institutions? No, no. So anywhere in the world, except for any countries that the State Department currently has bans on on so, a ban list, correct? Yeah, so North Korea would be an example of one of those countries that would not be eligible because we would not legally be able to send money to a North Korean student studying in North Korea. That makes sense. Um, a second question that came in, are students in graduate certificate programs eligible for a scholarship? Certificate programs, no. You have to be a degree-seeking student. Okay. Another question that came in was, may I apply if I want to go to school, but I have not currently been accepted in a program, so I'm seeking to become an EM student. No, you'll, you'll have to have that acceptance and the proof of enrollment to go ahead and, and apply at time of application. But we do encourage you, if you get to that process, uh, to go ahead and apply next cycle. Um, it's around the same time every year. Um. Another one, what if students have only one to two years to go to complete their degree? Um, Teresa, I'm not sure where you're headed with that question. So um, our scholarship winners, it's, it's a one-time award. So, um, you know, if you were to apply, um, you know, in this cycle and win that award, it, it's that one-time award. It's not like a carryover um, award. 
Um, I don't know if you need to elaborate on it any further. And then Stephen has asked how many credits are considered part-time versus full-time for a doctorate emergency management degree? That's going to be institutional specific. Um, different institutions will have different uh, requirements, and that's something we will take a look at application by application, institution by institution. One thing you're asked on your application is to provide us with the website of your institution's program, uh, and, and we will we will take a look at, to see exactly what is full-time enrollment versus part-time enrollment. I'll jump in here also, uh, Stephen. The enrollment verification that comes from your registrar's office usually has that information on it. And if it doesn't, I will be reaching out to ask you to have them provide that statement to us. So you, before you start your application, you should reach out to your registrar's office and make sure you're completing the correct application. Um, another person has asked, for the essays, do we have any word limit? What word slash page count do you recommend? Mm, that's a good question. Um, keep in mind, we, we don't specify a, a word count word limit. Um, but I can tell you, you've got to remember, these are college level essays, and we expect that type of an effort. Um, so just take that into account. And I will direct you to the application instructions. Application instructions provide all information. It's on the very last page of the application instructions, provide you the format and a suggested word count. Um, the style books and everything else that you need to know about essays. And Teresa, uh -oh. I saw your follow up on that. I do want to address it. Uh, you say many of your BAS emergency service administration students are working full time in responder fields seeking to diversify careers. These students are part time. Is there any hope of opening scholarships up to part time undergrads? Um, that's certainly something um, that we can discuss as a as a commission. Um, obviously, as of right now, um, we're set up as we are this scholarship cycle, but I would be happy uh, to bring that back to the commission for an open discussion. I have one other question that came in, and it is, can I submit an essay that I've already written for a class for school? Or do I have to use the essay questions provided? Uh, you definitely have to use the essays provided. There's no freelancing on the fire ground in here. Um, we, we compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. So yeah, I mean, if you were to submit, first of all, if you were, if you submitted an essay written for a class, that is self plagiarism coming from an academic. Um, but second of all, we're, when we score these, and, and I'm gonna, after we get through these questions, I'm, I'm, I wanna give you a little bit of information about the process itself. Um, we're, we're comparing apples to apples and scoring you that way. And so you would do yourself a huge disservice if you freelanced and wrote on another topic. Two other questions, Barb. Um, what are the best type of references to get? Should they be mostly academics or should they be considered, should you get other other references besides academic? You require academic references. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to have at least one academic reference, um, no doubt there. And then in the part-time graduate one, we're very specific about a supervisor um, being one of those. So be sure to follow follow the instructions very carefully. But when it comes to a reflection on your academic work, your next door neighbor or your boss at Chili's is not going to be able to speak to your academic work. Um, so be careful who you choose, um, really honestly, because we're looking for a view of you as a student when they're answering those questions. Um, and so often outsiders cannot provide us that picture. And one final question that has come in, and that is, what are the policies regarding the use of AI as I complete my application? <laughs> You've asked the right question um, to, again, the academic um, speaking over here. Uh, we absolutely forbid the use of AI. 
um, and or frown upon plagiarism in your work. So if you are uh, writing and citing as you should be, uh, your sources should be cited, of course, and um, not using artificial intelligence in a shape, way, or form. Um, all your work should be your original thought. And that's what we expect um, because emergency managers are critical thinkers. And that's what we're assessing. Um, you're not going to have that use on the job in the middle of a crisis. And so we don't expect you to be using it to assist you um, in a scholarship application process. And another one for the academic just came in. Should we tackle the essay like a research paper, like referencing the literature and then write like then write what I think? I highly recommend that. I highly recommend that. Again, these are expected to be written at at the college um, at the college level. That's where you're at. And that is all of the questions. Unless someone else wants to quickly put another question into the Q and A. Are we good there? nothing is coming in so we are good okay so real quick guys before we go um if you have not had a chance to take a look at the commission's composition i wanted to give you a little bit of background on that as well as the actual process kind of of how we we score you know and what we do just from a very high level so the commission is made up of about 30 practitioners and or academics or like myself a pracademic a practitioner and an academic from all sorts of sectors within the emergency management homelands setting. So you've got emergency managers, you've got college professors, you've got folks from the private sector, the public sector, the military, uh, uh, the medical setting, you name it, they sit on this commission. So they bring various perspectives to the table when we talk about developing these questions every year um, and then sitting down and reviewing these essays when you submit your packets. So what happens is all these packets come in and Dawn is our program coordinator, makes sure that these packets are complete. Only the packets that are complete 100% by the rules get um, approved to move on for, for the process of selection and grading. And so before we even begin the process of reviewing your applications for scoring, uh, Dawn puts a call out and says, um, here are the schools represented. Are there any conflicts of interest? Because right away, if any of us has a relationship with students from any of these schools, we have to be recused from reviewing those particular applicants. So right away, the playing field again is completely leveled. So if I'm teaching for so-and-so or have a relationship with an existing school, I cannot score that student's paper. So right away, we level the playing field there. Then at that point, no fewer and on average between five to seven commissioners will actually read and score each paper based on a set matrix. And so an average of scores is developed to come up with a score on every student's um, submissions until a, a scored list is made to, to figure out who the highest scoring um, uh, student is to, to make that award. So it's pretty much a blind review. Nobody knows who's scoring who. Don, the keeper of the list, is the only one who knows who's got who and who's doing who. Beyond that, we know nothing, literally, until she sits down and tells us who the highest scoring people are. Um, and then and then we, we figure out how much money literally we have to award, and then we, we, we award it. Um, so it, it's a very blind and fair process. So, you know, in the truth of transparency, I wanted to kind of let you know what the background of the folks are and how many of us there are 
um, evaluating the work you're submitting and, and how we come to the conclusions that we do. You've got some very highly respected professionals evaluating your work. So we expect it to be the best you got. Uh, my recommendation is bring the A game with these essays. Every year since I've been on the commission, they keep getting better and better and the cream rises to the top. It always does. Um, it's, it's really impressive and it's really impressive um, to where our recipients have landed. Um, we have a young lady who um, won a scholarship. It's only been a couple of years. Uh, Savannah, who, who's not with us on this call, um, who landed her first job out of her program with South Carolina Division of Emergency Management. Not a bad gig for somebody fresh out of school. So it just goes to show you how much this scholarship, as, as the others have shared with you today, can make a difference on that resume. Uh, not only the financial help, but the networking capabilities at the conference uh, to that bump on the resume uh, to opening doors to a career. So it, it's much more than, than just the money. Uh, to me, it's the, the total value and, and just being able to be proud to say you were a scholarship winner. I wish I had known about it when I was in school. Um, I blew a big opportunity, uh, but you guys have a great opportunity here. So um, I, I thank you all for attending. Don't think uh, yet. We've had more questions come in. So oh, more questions. Thing, yeah. Okay. One came in from Teresa Ward. Okay. And she asked, how will we know? the new scholarship criteria in the future. And I did announce, uh, respond to that one quickly. Okay. And, you know, any changes to the program are announced on the webpage. New criteria would be announced when we announce a new application period, but all criteria and any changes to our program have to go through approval by the IAM USA Board of Directors. And you can look for things in the IAM bulletin on the IAM webpage. And if it's really, really a huge announcement, we might also put it in the IM dispatch and out on social media. We also had a question from Chaz Hall. Will we be provided feedback on our submission if we are not accepted for the award? Yeah, unfortunately, we get such a high volume of submissions. Um, we're unable to provide feedback. Um, you know, I wish it were the case, um, but but yeah, that's something we have literally never been able to do just because of sheer numbers. And then we have one other question. I have, I just have the email of my reception of the of an award. Will a screenshot of that email count as the award document? Uh, Don, is that going to be acceptable on your yeah. end? If they put it on the award list, it's amazing what we get for that are proof of awards. I get pictures from newspapers, pictures of the awards, scans of um, trophies, you name it. But we also get emails where people are congratulated by whoever has sent them the award. So yes, that would work as your backup. So you put it on your list and then you'd use that as your backup document. Great, thanks. And that looks like the final question that has come in. Excellent. All great questions. All great questions. Well, if that's everything, that concludes the webinar. Um, I appreciate the attendance, the great questions um, from this group. And I wish everybody luck um, during this application process. And uh, hopefully we get to see four of you at least. Um, in Colorado Springs, which I'm looking forward to. Um, thanks to my fellow commissioners, to Dawn, to John behind the scenes running tech support. Um, and uh, we look forward to making the announcements uh, once the period's over and we've done the reviews. Take care, everyone. <laughs>